place, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and open them up to Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22. You know, the church and followers of Jesus, those people that um, live for him, that work for him, that serve him, um, sometimes they go through a, for lack of a better word, a funk. Have you ever been in a funk before? I've been in a funk before where it just seems like, you know, nothing is really just hitting the way it's supposed to, that nothing feels just like it you think it should, that things are not um, progressing the way you hope they would, or whatever it is, you get into this funk. And, you know, that's a dangerous place to be. Now, we all go through it from time to time, but sometimes, if you're not careful, you allow that to kind of begin to define you, and you just stay right there, and you think everybody else is crazy and not you. You know, there was a time just prior to the arrest and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus when his followers were allowing themselves to get into a funk. And what you find um, early on in chapter number 22 is the disciples, those people that were closest to Jesus, instead of being excited about the mission of Jesus and being excited about the miracles that Jesus was doing and being excited about the, the things that they saw happening, I mean, the, the blind were given their vision, the lame were made to walk, those that were deaf could hear. I mean, it doesn't get much better and much more exciting than that, right? Right? Okay, it doesn't get much more, golly, so much excitement in the room. It doesn't get much more exciting than that. And yet, in the midst of that, in the midst of everything that was going on, the disciples are having this conversation. I'll tell you what, when Jesus takes over, I'm number one. I'm number one. And they start having a discussion like, well, you think you're number one. I think I'm number one. I think I'm his favorite. No, no, no. He told me. He called me his beloved. Okay? And they're having this side conversation about in the kingdom, who's going to be the best? Is it me? Is it him? Is it her? What's going on? Who's going to be in charge? That's what I want to know. And that's the discussion that they're having. By definition, they have allowed themselves to get into a funk. Instead of being focused on the mission of Jesus, instead of being excited about what God is doing around them, they're allowing peripheral issues, things that happen out here to the side that are not the most important things, they're allowing those things to have a priority in their life and they're having a discussion. They even go to the Lord himself and says, okay, now listen, we're, we're having this talk. Who's going to be at your right hand, me or him? Who's going, to be, who's going to, just come on, you can tell us. We're, we're both grown adults, you can tell. Who's going to be number one? And that's the discussion they're having. In the midst of that, listen to what the Lord said to Simon Peter. And this is the icing on the cake of what it is to be in a funk. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Notice the exclamation mark after the second word, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked for you. Now, that would terrify me. That, that would terrify me. If the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, looked at me and said, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But, and I thank God for that, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me and strengthened your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. That's a pretty strong statement. I'm ready to die for you. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster shall not crow this day, before you will deny me three times that you even know me. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on our um, time together this morning. We ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that we would never allow the minutia, the peripheral things, to stand in the way of seeing you clearly. Help us to never make such bold statements that we might later regret. Help us to temper our words and our emotions so that we don't fall into the same funk that Peter and some of the other disciples have fallen into. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. A shipwrecked man was stranded on a desert island. And he, 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 when he reached the island, he started doing what a lot of us would do if your boat went down. He started looking for debris that would wash up on the, the shores of the island. He starts gathering his stuff together. A few of his possessions happen to come up. And he's just scurrying as quickly as he can to get any piece of anything from the boat that he might be able to salvage. Painstakingly, he spends the entire day and early of the evening looking for all these parts. He does what most of us would do. He goes on the beach and writes the word help in big letters in the sand. He begins to do everything he can. He takes some pieces of material and he puts together like a, a white flag saying, help me. He begins to search the island for food and he finds a little bit of um, fruit ha trees hanging there. And he was really about ready just to kind of resign himself to the fact that I'm, I might be here for a while, so I need to start thinking clearly, and I need to start thinking wisely. I need to save my food. I need to look for water. I need to make shelter. I need to do all these things. He started a little fire nearby what his little makeshift place where he was going to sleep, gathered all of his things together, and he went to look for water. All of a sudden, he looked back where his place was, and he noticed there was a whole lot of smoke coming up from there. He scurries his way down the hill, runs down the beach, only to get to all of his things that had some way, somehow, caught on fire. Everything that he owned, everything that he was able to gather up, even the place under which he would sleep that night, was all gone. Early the next morning, he woke up and his mood was even worse than when he went to bed that night. Have you ever had a night like that where you just toss and turn all night and you wake up even worse in a worse mood than when you went to bed? That was him. He was in a funk. But then all of a sudden, he noticed out on the, just the edge of the horizon, there was a big ship coming. And then he noticed that that ship had made an adjustment in the course and was actually coming toward him. He began to jump up and down and wag his arms in the air, yelling and screaming. Of course, they couldn't see or hear him. But his bad mood became a good mood. And it even became better when they were able to send a little boat out, pick him up and get him up on the ship. The captain of the ship said, you're not going to believe this, but you are so lucky. We only pass by here once a month. And were it not for your smoke signal, we would have surely missed you. Now, there, there's a lesson in perspective for us, isn't there? The lesson in perspective is that sometimes what we view as a terrible, horrible thing is actually something God is using in our lives to deliver us, to set us free, to give us a victory where there may not any other way be a victory. So that's what we find in our story today. In our text, Simon Peter is made to understand the fact that he is about to be tested, and boy, will he ever be. He's encouraged in this revelation by the fact that the Lord himself will take an active part in his trial. Now, I know that I'm speaking to people today, and everybody fits in a couple categories. You either have been in a time of adversity, or you're getting ready to go into a time of adversity. Or maybe by the grace of God, you're on the backside of it and you're coming out of that time of adversity. I don't know what it is, but I know that we all face battles from time to time. However, I know that there's hope for you and there's hope for me. There's hope for all of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this passage lets us know that, what we, um, that we don't have to fail 
when the attacks come. Not if, but when they come. We don't have to give up and throw our, our hat in the ring. We don't have to just give up and, and become frustrated and unhappy. We don't have to crawl away in defeat, never to be heard from again. I want to show you that anyone can endure the trials, tests, and adversities of life if they follow Jesus properly. The first thing I want you to notice today is what I'm calling the persistence of the devil. Oh, he is so persistent. He is so persistent. He never gives up. He never stops. He never just gives up on you. He keeps on coming over and over and over. If you look at verse number 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. I don't think it was a one-shot deal. I don't think that the devil was running down a list like, okay, I'd like to try John this week and Timothy this week, maybe Paul later, um, but I, I would like Peter. I don't think it was like a laundry list, like, you know, just randomly. I think the devil kept coming and coming and coming and coming, saying, Peter, he's the one. Let me test him. Let me sift him. Let me put him to the grind real quick. Let's see what he's made of. Because I don't think he's made of anything that strong. He's your rock. Remember, he said, you are Peter, you are the rock. He's your rock. I'll try him. Let me go after him. Let me test him. Jesus said, Satan has asked for you. That he might test you. He's made a request. The word desired means to demand or to ask for oneself. The word you is a plural in nature. Uh, it's a request really of all the disciples. I'd like to test you, all of you. If I stood up here and I said, the devil is getting ready to test you, all of you. You would know that I mean each individual one of you. That's the way he's speaking right now. The word you is, in, is plural in nature. It means a request for all of them. His demand is that he might sift them. Now, that's an agricultural term that refers to the, the process of separating the husk from the grain. The wheat is crushed underfoot. It's ground up. It's broken so that it opens up to give the grain. When it's agitated, um, then they put it on big um, things that they make, and they toss this in the air. They toss these things up in the air, and the chaff, it just blows away in any kind of breeze, and the seed falls back down. And they'll just do this over and over and over, day after day, all day long. That's what they do to separate these two. The chaff or the husk just gets removed, and what is good and what is desirable stays. Now, Satan, what he wanted to do is tear the heart of God by proving that there was no reality to the faith in the lives of the disciples. Satan believed that he could crush them. He believed that he could have the victory over all of them. He had already done this with Judas. Remember that? Judas is sitting at the meal. Jesus, in his heart, he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's, what's going on with Judas. He even said, the man that dips his bread, he'll, he'll betray me. Judas had already done his dirty deed. But Satan believed that he could do that to all the rest of them as well. I'm telling you, friends, that we are in a battle against a determined, persistent foe. He wants nothing but to cut the heart of God. And by the way that he chooses to do that is by hurting you and your family. That's the way he does it. He comes after you because if he can hurt you as a child of God, he can hurt the heart of God because God loves his children. He wants to prove that the people that make up the Lord's church are little more than a bunch of phonies. He wants to show God that, the, that in this world um, that there are nothing except professions of faith, but there's no reality of people's faith. He wants to destroy everything that you value in your life. And that is a scary thing. The devil is persistent. He's always coming back time and time again for you and the people that you love the most. He wants to toy with your emotions so that he can destroy your home 
and he can destroy the church. You see, he knows that if he can just get your eyes off of the Lord Jesus and get them focused on the peripheral things of life, that he will win. He'll win every time. You know, it took me a while to understand this, but the devil is so much smarter than any of us. He's been around since the very beginning. There's nothing he hasn't experienced. He knows so much. He is not omniscient. He's not God. He doesn't know everything like God does, but he knows a whole lot. He's so much smarter than me, so much smarter than you, and he's very persistent. He has eternity before him. We just have what, what we're doing for lunch. Our views are different. We think differently. He's playing the long game, the, running the marathon. We're running the sprint. He's persistent. He'll keep on coming. Now, this raises a very important theological question that has been asked from the dawning of time. Why would God allow the arch enemy any of his demands? Why would God say, okay, you can have Peter? Okay, John, yeah, Judas, okay. Why would God do that? Why would God give in to any of his demands or any of his requests at all? Why doesn't God just banish him? Why didn't God just kill him? Those are great questions, and they've been asked for centuries, and some of the brightest theological minds of our days have tried to answer those questions. Why does God tolerate the activity of Satan at all? Revelation chapter 20 verses 2 and 3 tells us that at the end of this age when Christ returns, God is going to bind Satan and confine him for a thousand years that he should deceive the nations no more. After that thousand years, the final victory of God will be, um, will be when he throws the devil into the lake of fire where he will spend all the rest of eternity forever. God has the right and the power to put Satan out of commission anytime that he chooses to. And the question we ask in our finite minds uh, and ignorance is, why doesn't he do it now? Why go on century after century, day after day, week after week, year after year? Why just prolong the misery of mankind and allow Satan to wreak havoc on the world? Well, a couple things come to my mind as I've asked those very questions myself. Number one, it may be none of my business. Now, we don't like to hear that. We have a prideful, sinful response when someone says it's none of your business. Okay, we recoil from that, don't we? We kind of puff up a little bit like, what do you mean it's none of my business? That's our carnal nature that reacts that way. But at the end of the day, God doesn't owe me an explanation for anything that he does. God is God. I'm me. I'm not God. He's God. He can do whatever he pleases. He doesn't owe me an explanation. He doesn't owe me anything whatsoever. So it, it could be, it could be that the answer to that question, why doesn't God just swiftly annihilate the devil? It may just be none of my business. I worry about my business. Let God worry about his. So that, that's the first realization that I've come to personally, that it might not be any of my business. But I do think that the scriptures indirectly suggest a possible answer to this question. I think that when we look at what the scripture begins to suggest, it might encourage us and it might strengthen us to the task at hand. I think that the reason why God permits the devil to persist in this sifting work is that in the end, when everything is over, when all of it has come to a head, I think that ultimately it will be better for the church. Ultimately. Not in the immediate, not in the here and now, not right this second, because sometimes these things are very painful. But ultimately, it will be for the good of the church. It will bring more glory to God than we might otherwise bring to him. 
You see, it's clear from the whole teaching of the New Testament that God intends to bring his bride, the bride of Christ, the church, to a state of perfection through affliction and temptation. You can go back and read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, and um, chapter 3, verse number 17. We must suffer with Christ if we want to be glorified in Christ. That's Romans 8, 17. Through suffering and trial, our faith is refined. It's made stronger. It's tempered like steel. We're drawn to rely more heavily on God. Have you ever noticed that? That it's not when everything is just going great and everything's wonderful that we rely on God the most. We become very self rewarding. We say, man, I got the new raise. I'm going to go buy a new car. Hey, I, I'm doing really well. I got a great health report. I'm going to go do celebrate this way. Hey, I've done this and I'm going to reward myself. We could become very, very good at self-congratulations, self-reward. It's not in the great times that we are pressed to get on our knees in thanks to God for His goodness and His grace and His love and His kindness and His generosity. When does that happen? It happens during the tough times, the hard times, when we get the bad report at the doctor instead of the good report, when things don't look good, when our job looks shaky and unstable, when the economy begins to tank, when your retirement drops by 40%, when things just look bad, those are the times that God uses to drive us to our knees and rely on Him completely because I know there's nothing I can do, me, myself, there's nothing I can do to affect the stock market. I could get out of the stock market completely and no one in the world would ever know. There are things I can do and there's things I can't do, but I can't affect things like that, but God can. And that's why in those hard times, in the tough times, God uses those to strengthen our faith. I can tell you that there have been times in my life when I got the bad report, when I got things, everything looked like it was going bad. It put my mind and my heart in a laser focus on the things of God. All of those peripheral things that I used to think were so important and so magnanimous and just so weighty, you come to realize that they really mean nothing whatsoever. The only thing that matters is Jesus. He's the only thing. He is the singular thing that matters the very most. And when we keep our hearts on laser focus on Him, when we keep our minds on Him, we keep our heart focused on Him, then what we notice is that the little things that cause us heartburn and pain and all those things, they begin to drop to the wayside and we see Jesus more clearly. You see, not only does the ongoing work of Satan ultimately do good for the church and bring glory to God, but it, it, it also sees God as someone that is completely omniscient and completely in control. God is fighting a battle that he will absolutely, undoubtedly win in the end. There's no question about that. But instead of steamrolling over the enemy all at once, he combines strategic advances and retreats and allows the enemy some illusion of success and brings out all of their arrogance and hatred for him. And he does this so it can be seen for what it is. In the wisdom of God, he knows when the end will come. He knows when the battle will be over. He knows the, the decisive moment when Jesus will return again in his glory. He will give way for a time to allow the enemy to rage in defiance and in hatred toward him. And all will see that sin for what it really is. And he will close in and destroy the enemy in such a way that none can doubt the wisdom and glory and power of the Almighty. The devil is very persistent. Number two, not only do we see the, the, 
the persistence of the devil, we see the deliverance of the Savior. Look at verse number 32. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. You see, all the disciples were in Satan's sights. But Peter received a promise of intercession. Jesus, Jesus looks at him. He says, I'll tell you. He said, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. He's prayed for him. He's interceding on Peter's behalf. Now, I'm sure that Jesus was praying for all the disciples, but he's praying specifically now for Peter because he knew that Peter was about to go through the biggest fall of his entire life. And he says that in verse number 34. He said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Not just once, so it could be, oh, it was an accident. I didn't mean to say it that way. You misunderstood what I said. I, 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 I meant to say it this way. That's what I meant. No, no, no. I don't know him. Later, I don't know him. Get away from me. I've never seen him before. Undeniably. Disappoint the very heart of God. To say that he doesn't even know Jesus. Now some of us live like we don't know Jesus. But to say it with your mouth three times, I don't know him, is a whole nother level. It's a whole nother level to say something like that. You see, all the disciples failed the Lord that night. If you go back and read in the Gospel, Mark chapter 14, you get down into round about verse number 50. You see that all of them failed him. All of them were scattering. All of them were scared. They were all anxious. But Peter went beyond simple failure into the realm of outright denial of any relationship to Jesus at all. The times of testing and failure will come in your life and mine, but in the midst of them, we need to take courage in the fact that we have someone, the Lord Jesus, pleading our case in heaven. He's taking our part. He's praying for us. He's making intercession for us. He's there shoring up our faith in prayer so that we can withstand the persistent attacks of the devil. You see, Satan may have his devices and schemes to tempt us and to try us, but Satan does not have the last word. In the midst of his scheming and planning, Jesus says, but, but, I have prayed for you. I'm with you. I'm behind you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you power. To stand until the trial passes. You know, Jesus will never leave you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Even though you might be in a funk right now. You may be going through a tough time right now. You may be getting ready to come out of that tough time right now. And not even know it. I'm telling you, Jesus will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's always there to stand with you regardless of the task or trial. Just because a temptation is offered doesn't mean that you have to fall into sin. Jesus can equip us with the resources that we will ever need in order to be able to withstand anything that the devil can throw at us. And that brings us to the third thing. The saints of God have a distinguished future. We have a future that is very bright in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at verse number 32, Jesus, but he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He failed Jesus. But see, no failure should ever be viewed as permanent. A failure is not final in your life or mine. They might be a temporary setback. It may be a long-term setback. But your failure is never the final end game. God has a plan. And God will bring you through that in the end. Peter will fall. 
We know that from Scripture. He did exactly what Jesus said he would do. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Rooster crows. He did it. It was exactly like Jesus saw and said that it would be. Peter failed him. He failed miserably. But that's not all that Jesus said. Jesus didn't just say, you're going to fail me. He said, when you have repented or come back to me. He, he puts that light of hope. Failure is not permanent. Failure is a temporary setback. God has the ability to bring you out of it and bring you through it. We have to trust him. Peter was going to be restored. God knew that. Jesus knew that. Peter didn't understand it yet. But God had a plan. He was going to be restored. You know why this message is so vitally important? It's important because I'm speaking to people who may be currently under the attack of Satan himself. A persistent, ongoing attack. Or maybe someone that's getting ready to be attacked. Or maybe someone that just needs a little handful of hope to understand that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Just hold on. Keep looking to Jesus. Hold on. Help is on the way. You'll be set free. God has promised that. Your failure is not permanent. It's not the end of the line. There's hope. You need to know that failing the Lord does not have to define your life. There's forgiveness and joy in the restoration that God offers. You see, the way we receive forgiveness and restoration is through confession, repentance, and forgiveness. Those three things, confession, repentance, and forgiveness. When we come clean about our sins and we turn away from them, the Lord will forgive and restore the fallen one to a place of service and blessing. Think about the story of the prodigal son, right? He failed his father. He ran off to a faraway land, took his inheritance with him. He burned through all of that money in no time flat. But there was confession. Father, I have sinned against you. There was repentance. I'm sorry for what I've done. I've changed my life. I've left that old way behind. I want to come back to you now. Will you receive me? And when there was confession, I've sinned against you. There's repentance. He turned his back on the old way of life, the, the way of waste and, and all the things that he was doing. He turned away from that. Then there was forgiveness. The father threw his arms around him. He put his ring on his finger, put his cloak around him. He said, my son has come home. It's a beautiful picture of a wayward child of God that, that has gone off and lived a life of sin, but they have come to a point in their life where they've confessed that sin. Father, I have sinned against you. They've repented of that sin. They've turned their back away from it. And now they are just waiting for forgiveness. You know, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When you ask God to forgive you, God never says no. God loves you and God is a forgiving God and God will set you free. All you have to do is ask. You see, when a person walks away from the things of God and goes into a, into a life of sin and he stays there, it means that one of two things is true. Number one, it's possible they were never truly saved. You know, John said, said it something like this. They were of us. They were among us, but they were not of us. Because if they were of us, they never would have left among us and and that's that's a, a hard truth that there are people that are among God's people in the church that are not truly saved there are people sitting maybe in this room today you are among us you're among friends today you're among us 
but you may not be of us. That means you are not a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ like the rest of us are. There's hope for you because God brought you here today for that very reason. So that you could hear the precious gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved today. You can become part of us, not just be among us. So the first thing that's true is that maybe they were never truly saved. The next possibility is that that person is in open rebellion and they are subject to the wrath and chastisement of God. You don't ever want to be in that place, friend. No sin, no sin is worth that kind of price to put yourself in a place where you are under the wrath of Almighty God Himself. You're under the chastisement of the Lord. That's a terrible place to be, and it's a painful, painful place to be. You see, genuine faith may falter, but it will never ultimately fail. Peter came back because he was genuinely saved. He was a follower of Jesus. He loved the Lord even though he failed. Even when he was sifted by the devil himself, he proved that his profession was genuine. There was some chaff in his life, and the devil threw him up in the air and back down and threw him up in the air and back down. But ultimately, that chaff was blown away, and what was pure and what was good was left. Peter made it. He came through his trial. That grain of faith was real and genuine in his life. Now, there was certainly some foolishness. Peter made some bold statements. And listen, I I find that sometimes my mouth engages before my brain does. That, That happens to all of us sometimes. Unless you're just one of those really thoughtful individuals that never opens your mouth until you've really, really thought something through. I'm not wired that way. Sometimes my mouth just kind of fires and my brain says, oh, (laughs) oh, (laughs) maybe we should backpedal that a little. Maybe we should pull that back a little bit. Let's clarify that real fast. That's not a good place to be, but Peter did the same thing. He said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I will follow you. It doesn't matter. Even unto death, I'll follow you. Oh, he was so bold. It's easy to be bold when the soldiers aren't standing in front of you. Isn't it? It's easy to be bold then. He vows to go to prison or even to death to prove his allegiance to Jesus. And Peter forgot a very important principle. Here it is. Never say never. You got that? You should know that by now. Never say never. I never do that. I would never do what Peter did. Oh, I I love the Lord. I love the Lord more than Peter did. I would never, never say never. Under the right circumstance, at the wrong time, in the wrong place, around the wrong people, there is evil locked inside of your heart that you don't even know about. Never say never. We need to walk it through this world in humility, don't we? When we see someone that's fallen into sin, God should impress on our hearts it is only by the grace and mercy of God that that's not me. That's how we ought to view things in life. Not to be so bold that we would say, never, I'd never do this, I'd never say that. I would never hurt this person. I would never do anything to them. I would never, 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 never say never. Never say never. Because when you do, You're setting yourself up on a pedestal waiting. You're challenging someone to knock you off of that. That happened to Peter. The devil was allowed to sift him. The devil was able to put him under the grindstone. The devil was able to make sport of him. And he fell. And he failed the Lord. You see, sometimes we become emboldened by the areas of our life that we think are our strongest areas. Oh, well, I might, I might sin this way, but oh, I would never do that. I might do this, but this is a little sin. I would never do that big sin like that. Never. Uh-uh. No way. Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah, you would. 
The heart of man is dark and it is desperately wicked. The heart we have in us is wicked beyond your wildest imagination. And under the wrong circumstances, wrong place, wrong time, wrong people, wrong opportunity, all of us could fall into any known sin. Never say never. Be humble. Recognize that we walk through a dangerous minefield. And it is just by the grace of God that we go. Satan has a lot of power to try to destroy lives. But thankfully, it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus has done everything necessary to provide a plan of salvation that will work for all of the people. He has promised to pray for us, to see us through times of temptation, times of sifting, times of challenges, times of of sinful opportunities. But he's also promised to forgive us and to restore us when we fail. Friend, I'm telling you, there's no reason whatsoever for you to allow sin to devastate your life. There's no reason for you to allow that to hurt you anymore. If you want help in the face of times of sifting in life, you can find it in Jesus alone. There's a great lesson for us here. Sometimes God will deal with you directly, strengthening your faith alone in the wee hours of the morning. But most of the time, most of the time, God will strengthen us and strengthen our faith through another person. God will send some of us a Simon Peter who will ju- just brings words of grace that we might keep our faith strong and say, you know what, I've made those mistakes before. Let me tell you what God did in my life, and maybe it'll help you also. We need to trust the Lord that He puts people in our pathway, and He puts things in our way to encourage us and to strengthen us along the way. The psalmist was right. Weeping may tarry for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Trust Jesus today. Trust him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, each and every one of us that are sitting here today have 